So hi there. Firstly, uh, I would like to um, thank my I would I would like to thank my colleagues at PIDS for for mounting this event. And I also want to mention that the finding of these various studies are group efforts of our very young, dynamic, and uh, very competent health team at PIDS, uh, namely Jana Uwe Lalcases and uh, some of our consultants, and of course our friends. Um, friends and collaborators in the Department of Health, in NEDA, and Center for Global Development in DC. So the, the motivation of this public seminar is basically twofold. So first, um, we want to basically unfold a looming public health crisis. Um, the impact of the pandemic on, on both COVID and non-COVID patients is very extreme. Uh, but in terms of the indirect effects or impact on non-COVID patient, it's barely discussed, right? So it's, it's critical that someone needs to actually examine and tell the other side of the story. And the second um, motivation is we want to start conversations, right? Within the government and within the public sphere about um, the, broad, the broader health impact of the pandemic, both direct and indirect, to achieve a well-informed, calibrated, public health response. I think one of the narr narratives that we've heard throughout the pandemic is the oversimplification of the issue. Um, but COVID in itself is a very complex problem that requires complex solution. And whether we like it or not, this will entail a lot of challenging trade-offs, right? And to say that, you know, we only need four to five simple things to overcome this pandemic could be very harmful and misleading, if you ask me. So, but whatever policy choices in the country will have a very tremendous repercussion. So we are left with no choice, but to assess uh, the different trade-off of different policy approaches. So hence it's important for us to understand the total harm um, on health caused by the pandemic. So the title of my presentation is the multifaceted health impacts of, of, of COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So next slide, please. So in the Philippines, um, measuring total harm caused by the pand pandemic, uh, when we're doing this study is very challenging. In terms of the direct impact, it might not be perfect, but the government has built an entire health information system that regularly monitors um, COVID cases, um, hospitalization cases or death on a daily basis. I've been working uh, uh, with the health sector for a few years, uh, understanding the data system for a long time. And in fairness, and I must say this, that building a health, a health information system during the pandemic for a short period, um, given the country's fragmented healthcare system and limited capacity, right, uh, at the local level is already a great feat, right? But, but for a long time, even before the pandemic, real-time disease surveillance has been a major, major challenge. A lot of you are working in the health sector, and we know this. Um, this is not a problem of the, ad, the current administration alone, but this has persisted for a long time. Um, it got across governments and, dif uh, and different administrations, right? Uh, we don't know what's happening uh, um, in many hospitals and rural health units. The, the death and cases related to COVID that we see every day barely reflects the total harm caused by the pandemic. Um, without any health information that allows us to measure what happened to, you know, cardiovascular diseases, uh, how, what happened to a pregnant women in a, in a far-flung area, and other indirect health effects, they are usually gone unmeasured, right? They, we don't know what's happened, what happened to them during the height of the pandemic. And as they say, you know, um, um, if you are un if if, the, if a particular event is unmeasured, they will never be unmanaged. They will never be managed. So, for us, um, um, it, it is important to think, therefore, um, um, measuring uh, um, the indirect effects of of, of health uh, of, of the pandemic. Next slide. So, I just want to uh, mention that most of the, the findings of this study were lifted from various studies by the health team at PIDS. Uh, um, we examined the deterioration of PhilHealth claims uh, for high burden conditions during the pandemic. 
um, they, they, they are published at PIDS website in, in Lancet Regional Health and Center for Global Development. So um, if you want to read more about the methods and the more detailed analysis, you can check it. They are all open access. So I would not go through all the, the details of the methodology in this presentation, but the, just the, the gist of this finding uh, of these of, of these studies. Next slide. Um, I just want to show you this, I think a very important framework that basically guided our our analysis or our or, or the narrative of this paper. So this just basically shows you the framework uh, that we we use to examine the indirect health effects right of the pandemic and how the general health system is typically or usually uh, disrupted because of the pandemic and the associated policy response to it. So in general, the pandemic and the policy approaches to mitigate the spread of the virus basically disrupted the supply ecosystem of the health system. Supply side meaning um, the funding mechanisms, the supply chain, um, the health workforce that are restricted and reallocated to, to COVID response. So these disruptions will impact the delivery of traditional public health programs like maternal and child health services, non-communicable diseases, uh, um, immunization, etc. And the poor uptake of these services have a very um, uh, long-term, have a short, medium, and long-term impact that, enormous, that, that, that are very costly. For example, uh, the short-term uh, impact would be, you know, unattended emergencies, right? Uh, in many other countries, in African countries, they've seen increase in infant mortality rates, but we don't know yet if we are seeing that pattern, right? In the medium term, um, we see uh, poor adherence to medicine, like you know, rise of drug resistant uh, uh, um, uh, uh, infection, right? And other disease outbreaks. For example, in the UK, they've seen um, increase in cases for uh, RSV or respiratory syncytial virus because in children, right? Um, and of and of course, the long term impact, right? The chronic malnutrition. Um, um, there is expected increase in stunting rates in the medium to long term. And more interestingly, uh, these implications has huge um, uh, equity uh, angle, right? In other countries, this impact has severely impacted the most uh, vulnerable population. We've seen higher rates among the poor or among women, among children. So we expect that that will also be the case in, in, in the Philippines. So next slide. So why it matters to think about the indirect effects, right? Why the death, COVID death and death hospitalizations are not enough to measure the impact, right? Um, um, it matters because most of us working in the health sector, we know that the coverage um, uh, uh, rates of uh, key basic health indicators before the pandemic is pretty low, right? And to me, a further decline of, of these um, key uh, health indicator will be very catastrophic to population health and well-being. So, so the left side uh, just shows you the UH index in the Philippines relative to other countries. This happened before the pandemic 2017, right? And UHC is basically an index measuring the coverage of basic maternal and child health services and CDs and infectious diseases, right? Uh, and we know that even before the pandemic, the Philippines is lagging behind in these coverage indicators, um, even lower than you know relatively poorer countries like Vietnam, right? So further decline of these intervention uh, of these coverage rates will be very catastrophic. So uh, I just gave you some examples here. Um, uh, only 50% of, of children have received prenatal care, um, uh, visited health provider uh, because of pneumonia is 55%. We all know that our child vaccination rate is also low. Uh, uh, there's also issues in, in TB treatment coverage and ART for HIV. So, so we, 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 these indicators are relatively low compared to other uh, aspirational peers or regional peers. Um, next slide. Um, so with that, the objective of, of the study, uh, there are two objectives of the study. So number one is to demonstrate the disruption of essential healthcare services in the Philippines. And the second is to estimate the economic costs of both direct and indirect health impacts of the pandemic. Next slide. So let's just start with a, a brief overview about COVID-19 pandemic. I know everyone knows this already. So the Philippines 
is one of the uh, countries severely affected with COVID-19. So as uh, Dr. Urbeta said, we have recorded 2.8 million cases, uh, around 45 to 46,000 deaths. Um, uh, if you look at rankings, the country ranked uh, 21st, I guess, in terms of global um, number, in terms of total death, but significantly lower when you adjust it with population size, right? Um, uh, we have around 350 deaths per, per million compared to around 650 deaths uh, at the global uh, average. So, however, in many, uh, in, uh, as, as many infection, um, COVID infection um, have gone undetected, epidemiologic models suggest that the total infection that we are recording is around four to five times lower than the, the, the uh, in infection rate, higher than the official DOH tally, of course. Next slide. So, so you were using PSA or the Philippine Statistical Authority if we examine death costs by COVID-19. Um, so the uh, COVID-19 uh, now accounts for around 6% of the total uh, total death in the country. Um, but we ex that's for 2020, but we expect higher death toll uh, for 2021. So for example, if you look at the uh, uh, interim report for for deaths in, uh, in, in, PID, in PSA, uh, um, the total number uh, of death from June to July already accounts for 9% of the total death, right? But we, we want to uh, have this analyzed at the end of the year, but it's increasing. Um, uh, uh, or we have we recorded higher death toll uh, in 2021. Next slide. So, so in addition to death, uh, the reported death, I think excess death uh, could provide a very uh, uh, important information about the true disease burden of the pandemic. So in just, just to, brief, to give you a brief um, definition of terms like in epidemiology, excess death is one of the commonly used indicators uh, of the overall impact of the pandemic on disease burden or mortality. So it includes not only the confirmed death, um, uh, but also the unconfirmed death and other de deaths uh, from indirect causes, right? So uh, the figure shows that the number of deaths compared to the projected death for 2020 uh, uh, is, is much, much higher um, in, in 2021, but we don't see a conspicuous uh, um, um, excess death in 2020, um, uh, which is uh, uh, similar to the previous slide that we see more excess death in 2021 than in 2020. Um, it will be very interesting to see the cause of death that drives this increase. So in 2021, uh, most of the slight increase in excess death can be attributed, for example, of mental health, right? We see that mental health uh, mortality increased from around 2,800 uh, in 2019 to around 4,300 in in, in 2020. So there's an increase in in uh, number of deaths uh, 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 from I, I'm accounted uh, I'm from from mental health, and but decrease in other uh, in other diseases. Next slide. Uh, just to give you um, um, about just give just to give you about just just to give you a little bit of of information about um, our policies in in controlling the pandemic. So we, we all know that lockdowns has been the main the mainstay um, interventions to control the spread of the pandemic. So uh, the, the Philippines has imposed one of the strictest lockdown in, in the world. So you can see here, um, uh, this, this figure just shows you the stringency index of the Philippines compared to our ASEAN neighbors, right? So the country has consistently recorded a high stringency index uh, since the start of the pandemic. So um, it recorded the highest stringency uh, in around March. The, the, that's the beginning of the pandemic, right? And that persisted throughout uh, 2020. So, um, but the, the social and economic and health repercussions of prolonged mobility restrictions, school closures, and border controls are costly. So therefore, um, uh, it is important for us to examine both the indirect and indirect consequences of the pandemic and the associated policy response. Next slide. So I'll just, uh, so this will be uh, the, the, the first slide uh, describing the, the findings of our different studies. So let's start describing our 
findings using field health claims. So, uh, but I urge you to, to read the Lancet Regional Health and CGD papers for the methodology and the detailed analysis. Um, but in this study using field health claims of 12 high burden conditions and five major procedures, we examined the monthly claims from field health and ass assess the changes compared to the same pre period of the previous year, which is uh, 2009. So we adjusted this for seasonality, right? There might be um, um, uh, uh, impact there. So we adjusted for seasonality. So I want you to look at the left figure. So um, uh, this is the number of claims uh, divided, uh, uh, disaggregated by medical claims and procedural claims, right? So, so when, so we selected for, for medical claims, we selected 12 major condition which accounts for about 80% of the total disease burden in the, or, sorry, it's about 50 to 60% of the total uh, disease burden of the country, meaning these are the major causes of uh, years life loss, right, uh, uh, in the Philippines. So they are uh, actually very, very important. So the claims for 12 medical claims on average declined around 50 to 60% in 2020 compared to the previous years, right? Um, the decline in procedural claims, however, is not substantial or is not, is not significant. But when you go deeper, you see very interesting patterns later. I'll describe it later. So now I want you to look at the right. So if we examine uh, the claims by disease, uh, a lot of interesting pattern um, happens. So there's a huge heterogeneity or variation um, across diseases, right? So we, we can think of several conclusions here. So first, infection, infectious diseases and respiratory uh, conditions decline, right? So like uh, acute gastroenteritis, uh, pneumonia, COPD, suffered the largest decline around 60 to 80%. So, and again, I want to emphasize that age or acute gastroenteritis is very common in children. So a lot of children might have not, um, have gone to facility for checkups uh, related to acute gastroenteritis. Second is, while conditions are diseases that needs urgent care, like cancer, chemotherapy, CKD, uh, suffered a slower decline around 20%. That, ex that is expected because it's, it's actually more urgent. Um, third is that the conditions that need maintenance, like as diabetes, uh, um, uh, 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 IHD, or the heart diseases, uh, also declined by around 40%, right? So nonetheless, I, I think that the gist of this is that all medical claims suffered large decline, and we don't see any recovery until the end of the year, uh, unlike in many countries like in the US where they see recovery in the fourth, third and fourth quarter. But for us, we've, we've sustained that low or pre, uh, very low levels of insurance claim uh, um, relative to pre-pandemic pre -pandemic period. Um, however, I want to emphasize that the procedures are highly variable. The procedural claims are highly vi variable. So uh, there is a rebound in, in, in cataracts, cataract in December. So you see a large spike because it's an elective surgery. So in December, the, the, the claims for cataract increase. C-sections and vaginal delivery also decline um, um, uh, throughout the entire period. Note, however, that these are ho uh, hospital claims. So we did not examine clinics. So there might be uh, issues going on uh, on vaginal delivery and cesarean sections, right? Next slide. Um, the pandemic has changed the dynamics and hospital admissions, right? So, so we feel that a lot of hospitals are trying to be more efficient, um, unconsciously or consciously. So if you examine the medical claims, there's a huge decline um, across level and types of hospitals. You see like all, like all levels you see decline, right? But in terms of in terms of procedures, important findings are unfolding. Like for example, as I've said, C-section and vaginal delivery and chemotherapy were decreasing at, in higher level facilities, but increasing lower level faci private facilities. So our hypothesis is that hospitals are unconsciously or consciously becoming more efficient. So higher level facilities are more, mostly COVID referral hospitals, so they go to lower lower level facility. But again, from a fi health financing point of view, what, what would be the implications of this, right? From an economic perspective, or he health economic perspective, this is actually good uh, because, for instance, you don't expect or you should, you should not want a pregnant woman to get delivered in a level three specialized hospital. You want them to deliver in level one or, you know, uh, clinics, right? So 
there, there, there is a thing going on there. There's a dynamics that we need to further understand. So uh, I want also to concentrate on chemotherapy. So more lower level facilities catering to, to, to chemotherapy. This is quite interesting because uh, I think the question now is, do we see more chemotherapy happening in level one hospitals and private clinics, right? So if you ask a lot of uh, doctors, they doing their uh, uh, um, chemotherapy in their clinics, right? So. So again, what will happen to the cost and, and quality, right? Uh, if we are shifting to this practice during the pandemic. So next slide. So we also tried to look at the uh, uh, the claims by may membership. So again, I think what just went, the, the gist of this slide is that the indigent members suffered the largest decline in claims. So the poor are not, now we begin to question. So the poor are not accessing health anymore, right? So. So this finding has huge equity implications. It means that the poor might have huge unmet need of healthcare uh, during the pandemic, right? So you see large decline in, 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 in their claims. Next slide. So, so that's for the insurance claims. So, but PIDS and DOH also collected data directly from hospitals. Again, we wanted to analyze this if there is a repository of hospital admissions and RHU consultations, but we don't in the country. So what we did is to get direct, get the data directly from hospitals and rural health units to validate our analysis using field health claims. So, so here, using admissions data from selected government health hospitals, you estimated that the median number of admissions by quarter and patient type, adult medicine, surgery, pediatrics, and ob -GYN. Uh, and if you see for adult medicine and, and pediatrics, the mean admission declined by 40 to 70% in the second quarter relative to the previous year with no signs of recovery uh, throughout the year. Uh, the decline in inpatient care among children is, is uh, in pediatric is alarming, right? So, so um, again, there's no signs of recovery for, for, pediatrics, for pediatric patients. But for surgery, you see a, a recovery uh, in the third and fourth quarter. Next slide. Uh, for for PIDS and DOH also collected data from rural health units. So the number of consultations in RHU significantly declined, particularly among vulnerable populations, right? So please note that rural health units are critical because they are the gateway of individuals and communities to the public health system. That's their umbilical cord, right? So they provide the basic healthcare services such as nutrition interventions, maternal and child and reproductive health services, NCD services, etc. Right, and a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, infectious disease uh, interventions. So using data um, from RHU, we demonstrated um, decline in consultations among vulnerable population, particularly among under five and elderly. Right, and I also want to to um, to highlight that the decrease in TB dots and hypertension which brings me to the next slide, right? Next slide. So we wanted to supplement the, we want to supplement uh, the RHU data with the actual program data from, from DOH. We got data for, for TB, HIV, and other diseases, but I want, I only included here uh, TB and HIV. So the, the coverage of critical public health programs also suffered. This is a major blow to, uh, for the country's effort in achieving health system targets. So the program data from DOH um, suggests declining um, um, uh, uh, number of HIV testing, diagnosis, and treatment, uh, which is also true for TB dots. Right? I, I won't go through it, but you will see here the, the decline in, 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 in these indicators. Right. So again, these are HIV and, and TB are like the basic and most critical public health indicators. And if you see the large declines in this, at least to me, it's, it's alarming. Right. Uh, okay, so next slide. So, so what is causing the decline in healthcare services then? So again, uh, in the paper, so we've elaborated on this. So, uh, and, and basically you can divide the, these reasons into two, demand and supply, right? So, um, so for demand, you will see um, confidence and safety. Uh, if you look at surveys, a lot of people are afraid of going to facilities, right? Uh, that's an issue. Another important thing that needs to be examined is the reduction in income. So declining income is also a critical factor, especially in a country with huge 
uh, or high levels of out of pocket. So in the Philippines, around uh, forty seven percent of the Philipp of Filipinos are are using. Uh, I mean, forty seven of our health uh, spending uh, in the in the country accounts for out of pocket. So. So this brings me to the fact that a lot of people will say, oh, the, the most important thing is health and instead of the economy. This is grossly uninformed to me because health and and health indicators are tightly linked. So if you do a basic uh, and, uh, uh, back of the envelope estimate, so if the income elasticity of healthcare demand is 0.7, right? That's the usual. And if you are, if the income of households are declining by around 8%, we will, see reductions in pre-pandemic hospitalization by uh, from 4.7 to 3.75 percent so when i say four percent before pandemic around four percent of the population are going to uh, uh i mean four percent uh, of the of filipinos are hospitalized but because of the de in decline in income we expect around 3.5 to 3.75 percent so that's a huge number when you convert that into actual number of filipinos right the third Demand demand issue is mobility restrictions, um, and for supply, there is you know the, the issues on overrun health facilities. We we know this story. Um, uh, second is reallocation of resources. If you do KIIs with DOH, so for example, the reduction for example in TB dots services could be attributed to the dwindling TB supplies because of reallocation of human resources and diagnostic equipment right for COVID response like the expert machines uh, for that's usually used for TB were repurposed for COVID testing. So, of course, you don't have something anymore for TB, right? So, uh, that these are some of the possible explanation wh why we see declining healthcare services in the Philippines. Next slide. I think I'm running out of time. So, next, um, so we, we tried to estimate the, estimate the economic cause of both the indirect and indirect impact of the pandemic. Uh, we worked together with NEDA on this. Um, but before we show the results, I want to basically, you know, describe the framework uh, that I use in estimating the impact. Um, so remember, in, in many empirical studies, healthcare services directly affects health, right? So if you are building hospitals, that will be affect health, right? If you're building RHU, that will be, you know, uh, that will impact health. But income as well, there is a link, um, an important link of income and health outcomes. So decrease in GDP will severely affect health and healthcare demand, right? So um, as I've said, when we say, oh, GDP declining is fine, as long as you have saved many people, it's quite dangerous. Uh, and remember the Preston curve, there is a linear relationship of GDP per capita and life expectancy. Um, and education as well, there is a direct link. So decreased schooling, like school closures will severely impact health. This is proven in many empirical studies, not only in this country, but in other in other part of the world. So when we say um, we just close schools, we need to understand that there is also health implications of that, not only the, the, the loss of le uh, learning, right? But there is also huge uh, health impact of closing down schools, right? So, but again, in our study, we did not estimate the income, the impact of income on the end in income and education uh, on the on on health, the direct impact of income and health. Um, um, but based on initial estimates, the impact of school closures around 11 trillion. But for, for this particular exercise, we only look at what would be the impact when, when we don't access health care, when what would be the impact on health, but we did not assess what would be the in, impact of income reduction or uh school closures right on health directly on health so it's not part of the estimation next slide so that's the biggest caveat, caveat for this this is what i'm telling about um this is just uh, 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 a slide showing the preston curve they call it the preston curve so that's the relationship of gdp per capita and your life expectancy so if you decrease your gdp per capita there will have a tremendous impact of your life expectancy so um, um uh, we expect that also uh, in the Philippines, as we've seen large declines in GDP per capita. Next slide. Um, sorry for the business slide, but I just want to elaborate the basic methodology in estimating the cost. So for the direct impact, we've estimated the year's life loss due to premature death. Because of COVID, um, we also estimated the life, life year's loss 
uh, because of this ability, right? So, so these are our standard formulas, right? In in using global burden studies, right? Um, so for non-COVID, uh, we use the standard formula in epidemiology called the population impact fraction. So here we estimated that dallies from declining inpatient care, um, declining outpatient visits, the impact of food insecurity on stunting, um, decrease uh, TB dots, uh, access to TB dot services, decrease in ART uh, services for HIV, increase in incidence in mental health, and declining prenatal care and child immunization and other NCD risks. So again, not all diseases are not included. So I will not go through the, the formula, but um, this is basically the, the intuition behind the estimation, right? So next slide. Um, so based on our estimates, the productivity losses because of premature death uh, and diseases because of the pandemics around 2.3 trillion. So this is a long run cost. So this is the lifetime cost. So you can see that the indirect effects for non-COVID is the driver of this cost, right? Um, um, meaning the indirect effects because of, you know, decrease in uh, access to different health services, et cetera, are basically the major driver of the, 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 the um, uh, life, uh, and the years of life loss, right, um, in this estimation. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of, uh, uh, or the intuition behind in the increasing disability adjusted life years because of the deterioration of essential healthcare services. So for example, we've, we've seen increase in food insecurity from 53 to 63%. Uh, so the lifetime cost is around uh, 650 billion pesos uh, of that. Um, so for TB dots, we've seen decline from 83 to 74%. So the, the cost of that is around 29 billion. Um, ART is 46 to 33, so that's 16 billion. Um, but for, for fully immunized children, um, uh, if you look at the, uh, what's it again? For, according to the DOH estimates, the, um, the decline is from 69 to 64%. But there is a projection that the estimates will decline this year to 48. So assuming that we will only vaccinate 48 percent, the economic cost of that is huge, around 300, uh, around 300 billion dollars, 100 billion pesos. So again, it's important for us to vaccinate children because otherwise that's that's very very costly. Next slide. Um, again, just a summary. So. Um, in the Philippines, inpatient care for high burden diseases sharply declined during the first year of the pandemic. So the poorest population suffered the largest decline. So children and a lot of vulnerable populations are bearing the brunt of the pandemic. Um, the number of consultation in RH significantly declined as well, particularly among the vulnerable population. Um, the coverage of critical public health programs also suffered a major, which is a major blow uh, uh, to the country's effort in achieving targets like SDG, um, health system targets, right? And the, the long run productivity losses because of both direct and indirect is around 2.3 trillion in, in that present value. Next slide. So, okay, uh, I'll, I'll be quick. So I have three recommendations. Um, so the first recommendation is actually we use this opportunity to, to, institu to institutionalize path-breaking reforms, right? So, um, Historically, it, it's really hard to institutionalize health reforms, but this is now the opportunity. So, for example, if you look at the socialized medicine in Western Europe and in Russia, um, these were established after the 1918 flu pandemic, and, and these systems are still enjoying this. This, uh, uh, I mean, these countries are still enjoying this system. So, there is a, 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 a legacy that we can actually push, which is to improve. Uh, reforms, right? Uh, second is to institutionalize primary care oriented and integrated healthcare systems. So many countries with strong primary care somehow uh, have better COVID response. Um, number three is adapt massive capital investments through adoptions of the health facility enhancement program, right? So in the Philippines, the number of beds is one per 1,000, uh, uh, which is similar to a lot of sub-Saharan African countries. We are transitioning to become an upper middle income countries, but the number of beds in the Philippines is similar to the poorest countries in Africa, right? So this is, that's alarming. So based on our modeling exercise, we need 2.5 per 1,000, similar to many upper middle income countries. And we aspire to be that in the next, what, in the ne next year, in the next two years. 
So we need to double the number of beds. So with 1,000 beds, even a slight increase in COVID, <laughs> your hospitals is already full. So, and, and, and that is the major thing that we need. We need more investments in, 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 in health facilities, right? Uh, in the health facility development program, we've elaborated how the private sector, government sector can participate, but uh, it's not the, the arena to discuss that, but there is huge opportunity for us to, to do more investments in, in facilities, right? But again, the number of doubling the number of beds um, entails not capital investments alone, but this should be complemented with HR reforms and, and governance reforms, right? So um, I just want to reinforce that. Next slide. I think this is my second to the last. So again, invest mostly in, in health information system. Um, implement standardized and non-fragmented electronic medical record in health facilities. I've heard, you've, you've heard many times this recommendation. Because this is very critical to allow quick and survey quick surveillance and ability to monitor and evaluate programs. So how do we do this, right? So how we need to link, we need to change how we we pay the providers, link compliance to financing reforms, link it to governance reform with DOH, right? So, and you know, example of that will be provision of grants, etc. Right. So again, it's not the arena, but there are mechanisms for for us to force somehow force. Uh, uh, health facilities to adapt uh, a standardized electronic medical records. If we have this, we don't need to collect data from hospitals and check, oh, bumababa yung cases natin for cardiovascular disease. If we just have that surveillance system, right? Um, and uh, again, incentivize the use of telemedicine. Uh, there are many uh, on, on how do we do that? You know, innovative financing. Um, how do we pay actually um, uh, telemedicine? So it's not it's not clear yet. Like, what would be the role of PhilHealth in telemedicine, right? So, and, sh and but of, of course, we also need to do a lot of homeworks on how do we ensure quality standards, right? Uh, in, when implementing telemedicine, and a lot of uh, a lot of um, accountability mechanisms, right? Uh, when we implement uh, telemedicine. Uh, next slide. I think this is my last slide. Um, again, there needs to be. Um, whether we like it or not, there is a growing consensus among ac academics that the COVID-19 will be here to stay. Um, and elimination might, might not be seen in the, in the next few years. Uh, it might, or might not be even possible. And as we expect the virus to be endemic, I don't know what that means, but, but the country needs to slowly transition, transition its governance structure of COVID response um, and include it in the country's public health program. You know, um, similar to how we control TB, HIV, or NCDs. Um, but I think this is the best strategy. How do we transition? How do we, how, do we, how do we think of COVID similar to TB or similar to HIV? Um, uh, well, I really don't know, um, but, but needs to be, this needs to be examined and, and studied carefully. Um, and we need to make sure that when we address or control or prevent COVID, it needs to be uh, holistically in parallel with other programs in the Department of Health, uh, again, like TB, HIV, and CD, right? So um, if you ask me, I, I don't know how to answer this, but I, I guess this is the right direction and many countries are now embracing this kind of transition. Um, um, and I, I think that's my last slide, so um, that's it. So many thanks again for, for listening.